you came to Dubai a few years ago, you'd have got this, sand and loads of it. Then an amazing thing happened. Fantasy became reality. In the space of just 20 years, Dubai turned from desert into a jaw-dropping oasis of stone, marble, concrete, glass and raw excitement. But the bolder and wackier the idea, the more likely it was to be accepted. Giant islands, the shape of palms, that could be seen from space. And soon they'll be the world's tallest skyscraper, a modern-day Tower of Babel that slices through the clouds at almost a kilometre above the ground. Dubai has become the centre of a modern-day gold rush. But the big question for Dubai is whether this great global credit crunch is going to bite here and whether that will turn the Dubai dream into a nightmare. Dubai is one of the seven states that make up the United Arab Emirates, under the rule of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Its reputation as a tax-free haven and land of opportunity has attracted 120,000 Brits, all chasing the Dubai dream. You have both completely lost your marbles. I mean, you have paid $50 million for a load of sand. A dream where your position in society can be elevated overnight and vast riches are there for the taking. It's oh, quite it's a journey insane. from it is. a secretary it is. on an officer of state to this, <laughs> flogging £17 million pound apartments in Dubai. In a country where Sharia-based law is dished out on crop-top wearing party-goers, what's it really like to live here? And mixing with the locals, I talk tactics with the man that bought Man City. There's the Burj Al Arab. And what about the world's financial meltdown? Are they feeling the heat? You say credit crunch, people say, whoa, whoa, there's no credit crunch in Dubai. It's not coming, it's, the, it's here. But lurking in the background, behind all of this, is the fact that in just 10 years' time, Dubai's oil will run out. The race is on. If you'd invested in property out here over the past six years, I'd give your financial advisor a raise, because you'll easily have trebled your money. But it wasn't for the faint-hearted. Four miles out to sea is probably the craziest property investment on the planet. For sale, 300 islands that, seen from above, replicate the countries of the world. This is absolutely ridiculous. I've heard about this place, I've seen the pictures, I know all the facts. But until you actually come out here like this and experience it for yourself, you have no idea of the sheer scale of it. 320 million cubic metres of redistributed seabed later, Dubai has not just put itself on the map, but put the map on itself. I'm heading for Britain. Gentlemen, permission to come ashore. Permission granted. Thank, thank you very much. Welcome aboard. Oh, you you see Welcome it. to the United Kingdom. Well, thank you very much. Let's head over to London, shall Why we? not? <laughs> Ex-Londoners Safi Qurashi and Mustafa Nagri moved to Dubai four years ago. Between them, they've just bought England. Dare I ask how much you've paid for it? Topping over $50 million. You have both completely lost your marbles. I mean, you have paid $50 million for a load of sand. Yeah, it's one view. Tell me some of the stuff what you're going to do, do here. here? Um, the idea very much is to have some luxury accommodation where you, where you can bring your boat, park it right outside your villa, swimming pools, spas. And how many are we talking about? You're talking in and around the 100 mark, right. 100 villas over here. So you're living in your own private villa, surrounded by, you know, absolutely amazing shorelines, beaches. I mean, you say views. that, but you're actually surrounded by the French over there and well, the Germans over there. I mean, they are worryingly close, aren't they? they, they, they you know, they have got closer. But luckily, there's still a bit of sea between us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining now these luxury villas here. Mm -hmm. And even if they went just for $5 million each, I've just worked out you'll make a profit of $450 million. But you have forgotten the cost of construction. Which is? Um, We're still working on that one. Yeah, well, You're still making what I think they call in Balham a nice little earner, aren't you? Well. Yeah. 
Yeah, look, I guess I guess you could say we might yes. be. I mean, that's a great story. Absolutely. Ballon Boy buys Britain. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Safi is a perfect example of a Dubai dream. Four years ago, he arrived here skint, having lost everything in a failed internet firm. Now, thanks to a series of shrewd property deals, he's the king of England and looking to invade France. But how did this little-known desert outpost become such a magnet for investors and those in search of a better life in the sun? Dubai has done an incredibly good job at marketing itself, largely through what at the outset appear to be utterly ludicrous projects. Think Dubai and you think glamour, wealth and a rich hedonistic playground. Hardly surprising then that back in Britain, wrapped under red tape, trapped under the dark grey skies, so many downtrodden wannabes think this place is utterly irresistible. Although Dubai is twice the size of London, the main action takes place in a frenzied 20 mile strip along the coast. The legendary Dubai gold rush can be traced back to 2001, when the law was changed to enable foreign nationals to own property. It coincided with the launch of the most famous of Dubai's artificial island projects, the Palm Jumeirah, which, because it's connected to the mainland, lured investors by the truckload. And my first impression is it's massively bigger than it seems from the sky. Apparently 4,000 properties were sold in the first 72 hours of the project being announced, before a brick had been laid. The weirdest thing about Palm Island is that five years ago, I'd have drowned by now because this was all water. Nothing quite prepares you for the sheer scale of their ideas. Palm Jumeirah is so huge, its central trunk supports two six-lane motorways. At the tip, three miles out, sits Dubai's latest five-star hotel, the Atlantis, complete with an underwater lost city in a fish tank. The Beckhams acquired a place here, and Ashley Cole and Michael Owen followed suit, quoting a Middle Eastern wag sumer. It may look like Brookside on the beach, but having a palm address is the ultimate status symbol, and living the dream on Frond D is Neil Petch. Neil came out here 14 years ago and now publishes the Dubai version of GQ magazine. Judging by his cars, a Bentley, a vintage Jaguar and a Ferrari, life is good. Okay, here we are, ladies. Throw in a Russian model wife and her glamorous friends, and I'd say palm living is very good. How much of these properties been going up by in value? Well, uh, about four villas on either side of me, no one lives there. People had them as an investment and they're going up at such a rate that they don't actually need to rent it. I wish I were in uh, that position. I mean, if you bought uh, that one at the start, for example, yeah. what would you have paid? Well, that was probably about £700,000, 2.6 million dirhams in our currency. And what would it be worth now? Uh, 15, something like that. So around six times what you paid for it? Exactly. So it's been an amazing investment for people. Yeah, it makes you question your own job when you're earning a lot less than your house is doing by <laughs> sitting there. And is there, like, in any development like this, is there a bit of, you know, keeping up with the Joneses? Absolutely. I mean, I've had to upgrade my barbecue several times. <laughs> <laughs> Dubai has learned a very British lesson. We do like to be beside the seaside. Waterfront property commands a premium, and building out into the sea will add 300 miles to their coastline. But when we struggle to build something as simple as a Millennium Bridge, how do you create an entire city in just 20 years? I have some days when I say, you know, this is crazy. <laughs> I want to go to New Zealand. I want to live in a bar. You know? And when you built it, how do you make sure the rich come flocking? This is ridiculous. I mean, how many towels are there? Why would you need 100 towels? And at the world's only seven-star hotel, I sample the Dubai dream for myself. There are times when we build things so astounding that they become testaments to human ingenuity. The pyramids of Egypt, the Great Wall of China, and now, Dubai? Extravagance and Dubai go hand in hand, but this really does take the gold-plated biscuit. It's rumored this seven-star hotel costs so much to build and run 
but it will never make a profit. But that's not the point. The Burj Al Arab is Dubai's Eiffel Tower, part of ruler Sheikh Mohammed's vision to put this place on the global map. The best rooms here will set you back 12 grand a night and come complete with one of the hotel's 16 white Rolls Royces and your own personal manservant. They boast that they cater for every whim at the Burj Al Arab, and that's certainly the case with me, because I spent my entire life waiting for a bed where I could go to sleep looking at myself. I'm here to meet builder Eddie Mitchell, who I last met at the height of the UK's property boom in Sandbanks, Dorset. Eddie was creating futuristic properties inspired by this hotel. He's been coming here on business for five years and is now a gold star guest, affording him extra special treatment. Watching you coming in, it was like watching a visit by the Queen. You know, it was like a, a cast of thousands offering you tea and dates and yeah, hand lotions. It's and... the same every time. Um, I've butt there that I've had for six years. He meets us every time we come here. Whatever time of day, he's at the door. It's like coming home. So, Eddie, last time we met was in Sandbanks, yeah. where the funny thing was there is that you produced properties like this, which are, you know, by any normal standard in Britain, completely barking mad, futuristic, emporiums of glass and concrete and everything else. Out here, you're known as Mr Boring, because, I mean, that is not even first base, is it? Not really, no, Piers. <laughs> I mean, you must love it here. It's like a permanent building site. Yes, yeah, but probably the biggest building site in the world. And after 30 years of building, I just love it. You're like a pig in a sty, aren't you, yeah, Eddie? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> For those who bought at the start in the Palm or the World or the Burj Dubai, how much money are people making? I'm sure people are making many millions. I mean, I heard of one Chelsea footballer who had a place on the Palm that he's never actually lived in. He paid £400,000 for it, and he's just sold it for three and a half million. Yeah, that's what he would have paid six years ago. And he would now make three and a half million? Yeah, definitely. Without setting foot in the place? Yeah. How have I missed out on this again? I wish it came here six years ago. No, but you always <laughs> seem to pop up in these places at the right time. I went to Sandbanks right at the peak. I've come to Dubai right at the peak. What I need to do with you, Eddie, is stick with you <laughs> in the down times. Well, you can come on site and be a builder if you want, Piers. <laughs> The great thing about Dubai is there's always a stunning new location to practice your golf. Oh! Oh! But you wouldn't have thought you could practice your skiing as well. This is Ski Dubai. It's 45 degrees centigrade out there, and in here, minus four. In fact, it's absolutely bloody freezing. <laughs> The thing about Dubai is that the crazier the idea, the more likely it is to be accepted. There are many extraordinary feats of construction underway in Dubai at the moment. A few more remarkable than this. It's going to be the biggest theme park in the world. It's going to be 107 square miles. Or well, to give you some idea of perspective, bigger than Birmingham. But even more extraordinary is the fact that they boasted that the catchily named Dubai Land will be finished into seven years. Achieve that in the current economic climate, and I'll eat my sunglasses. This is a model of what the theme park will look like, and quite frankly, it's one of the most breathtaking things I've seen in my entire life. There are going to be life-size replicas of the Taj Mahal, the Eiffel Tower, the Egyptian pyramids, even Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. There's a Las Vegas-style strip, only it's four times as big as Vegas. There's only one word for this. Bonkers. But in Dubai, biggest is best. This humongous fish tank is built inside the world's biggest shopping centre next to, yes, you're way ahead of me, the world's biggest building. I've been to lots of tall places in my life. The Empire State Building, Eiffel Tower. I worked at Canary Wharf for ten years. But I've never, ever seen anything quite like this. The Burj Dubai is already 720 metres tall, making it the highest building in the world. But the really scary thing 
is it still growing? Probably the most unnecessary sign of all time. Please don't lean on the doors. <laughs> <laughs> the sheer bravado of this structure beggars belief. They're even adding a new story every three days. It's another part of Sheikh Mohammed's plan to make sure Dubai stands out. The final height is still top secret, but the ambition is to be almost double the height of the next tallest building on Earth. The Earth's vanishing. I've never been this high in my life anyway. Mr Ali Alibar, the fifth most powerful man in Dubai, is chairman of Imar, the government-backed construction company building the tower. So we're right in the middle here on floor 160. We're 611 metres up. Yeah. There's still, as I can see, I mean, there are 20, 30 floors more already under construction. Yeah. Does it wobble, this? I mean, does it move around? No, it doesn't move much. Do you know how far? I think if it moves maximum, probably move this much. Who's going to be here? I mean, who will be on these floors? I think, indeed, these are office floors. People have bought private apartments here too, right? Correct. What was the most expensive one, do you know? A whole floor could probably cost you about $45 million, a whole floor. Oh, a bargain. Yes, yeah, a bargain compared to London prices, of course. <laughs> you know Sheikh Mohammed better than many people. How would you describe him? I've been with him 15 years, and there are times when his energy is, is so unbelievable. This building here, the first time we've designed it was 90 story. Mm. And the meeting was one minute. And his highness said, no. I said, okay. So I did, I think, about 120. He said, no. So I just brought a chart of all the tall buildings in the world. And I put in this building. And he said, okay, how, how much taller than the tallest? I said, well, we're about 40% taller. He said, good, you go. <laughs> Forty years ago, Dubai was nothing more than a dusty fishing village. The then ruler, Sheikh Rashid, had a vision to transform it into a hub for the world, as a port and as a tax-free business centre. It was an extraordinary and bold move. The philosophy was simple. Build it and they will come. And come they have. Now, under the rule of his son, Sheikh Mohammed, the vision continues. Dubai often feels more like a corporation than a state. That's because just three things matter here. Business, finance and success. Unlike in Britain, where huge developments can get bogged down for years in red tape and bureaucracy, over here they can go up in months. And the reason is quite simple. Sheikh Mohammed. Whatever the Sheikh wants gets done. And fast. Of course, being able to use millions of cheap workers from Southern Asia has made it all possible. In 2007, accusations were made of slave labour conditions. So Sheikh Mohammed set up a confidential free hotline for construction workers to report any abuse. As a result, conditions have certainly improved. But each year, UAE workers send home an estimated £4 billion in wages. So a recession in Dubai would have serious global implications. But trying to get anyone to actually talk about the possibility of economic downturn here in Dubai was like trying to get blood out of a stone. I turned to Michel Canu, a billionaire businessman from the ninth richest Arab family in the world. Are you totally sold into this vision, or are there going to be problems, do you think? Well, now there's going to be a lot of economic uh, upheaval globally, and it's going to come and affect us. See, no one mentions that here. I, mean, I, you I say, know, I know. You say credit crunch, people say, whoa, whoa, there's no credit crunch in Dubai. In, in the Arab culture, to say something, if you say it out loud, there's a perception that it'll happen. So we don't even call cancer cancer. We call it the, the disease that can't be mentioned. It's the same mentality. Is there a credit crunch coming in Dubai? Uh, it's not coming. It's here. It already exists. Now, for people to come and say, you know, this is the end and death of this area, it's not going to be the death of this area. What's going to be is a natural timeout, if you want, allow things to come back to its normal position and then move forward. Dubai, I think, is a good place to be if you're looking at 15, 20 years down the road. Because if you're looking at two years down the road, God knows what's going to happen in the next two years in terms of global um, uh, finance. During the boom times, Dubai was the hottest property market in the world. The carrot that had expats scurrying here faster than a bleached blonde to a footballer. Helen Tatum is typical of those that came chasing the Dubai dream. She landed here four years ago and owns Dubai luxury homes, 
one of the most successful estate agents in town. Today, she's showing me a flat aimed very much at the not-so-poor. Amazing views, vast amount of room. I mean, how big is this? It's 13,400 square feet. The master suite mm. takes at least a third of the apartment. So it's all about so the bedrooms out here, is it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what would it cost if you wanted to buy this? £17 million. Pounds. Wow. Who would buy a place like this? I mean, who's living in this block? Yeah, I mean, discretion is the word, but, I mean, we've got sporting personalities, we've got presidents of countries. At 15 times the size of the average house in the UK, who said size doesn't matter? I mean, it's just humongous. Yeah. This is not even... Well, sort of apartment is too loose a word. Well, this, I mean, this is... Hello! A... <laughs> I mean, it echoes. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, look at it. It's not a kitchen, it's a, it's a restaurant. That's the children's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. How silly of me. Here's the bathroom. This is the bathroom. I mean, this they is... take a lot of care over the bathroom. This is ridiculous. I mean, how many towels are there? There must be a hundred towels in here. Why would you need a hundred towels? I mean, it is just opulence on an almost regal scale, isn't it? It is. It's a staggering apartment. Perfect for your average multi-millionaire. This is a great view. Amazing view. Maybe not so good for a billionaire, which is why the next phase will have its own heliport on the roof. That is going to be just going for a higher level altogether. That's going for your billionaires rather than just the millionaires. And it's going to have its own helipad and, the, you know, they're working on their own immigration so that you can just jet in and... Well, this is and... so some <laughs> Russian oligarch just exactly. lands on the roof and out come immigration That's officials. Right. Yeah, Incredible. <laughs> What's a nice girl like you doing? Slogging 17 million pound apartments in Dubai. I don't know, it just happened four years ago. Set up my own real estate company and... Um, what were you doing back in Britain? I worked on the country estate. In Do, doing what, doing what? Um, as the estate secretary. You're a secretary? Estate secretary. Estate secretary, on sorry, I don't on on diminish sure. your role, but I mean, it's <laughs> quite a journey estate. from... It is. ..a secretary on, a, on an Oxfordshire estate yeah. to this. Yeah. And you're now glimmering in diamonds and Rolexes and well. stuff. <laughs> so life's been good for you, right, Helen? Yeah, it has. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and that's not the half of it. Helen now has her own polo team with eight Argentinian ponies and a full-time professional trainer. It certainly beats typing. Friday is polo day here at Arabian Ranches. It's a bit of a fixture of the expat community. A chance to revel in the good life whilst catching a chucker and slithering up the social ladder. Becky, from Bingley, West Yorkshire. Yeah. And here you are at Polo. Yeah, I'm at the Polo. <laughs> Bingley girls are not really used to doing this sort of thing, are you? Let's be honest. No. I came over here and I launched a magazine for another company and I've just launched this magazine. And I'm 28 years old, and I would not get that in the UK. It's not cool badly ones. for a girl from Bingley, have you? Yeah, it's all right. I'm quite <laughs> happy. <laughs> it's easy to get drawn into the good life in Dubai. At the buildings that are going up, somehow out here, your expectations are, well, just higher. But to live up to those expectations, you're going to have to have deep pockets, especially if you fancy a personalised number plate. I have the 93. And how much was that? Two million dollars. Two million dollars? Yes. And I'll find out what it's like to live where hedonistic Western playgrounds exist in a country governed by strict Muslim values. And what happens when you cross the line? Do you live in permanent fear that a wrong word could see you on the next plane back to Britain deported? I wanted to get an Arab perspective on Dubai. Fortunately, the man that bought Manchester City, Dr. Suleiman Al Faim, has a house here. He's made a fortune in property and is the Alan Sugar of Arabia, with his own apprentice style TV show and even his own catchphrase. Impress me. When he said he'd show me around the city, I didn't realise he meant in his own private jet. He impressed me. incredible to think about. Only 30 years ago, most of that would have been desert, right? 20 years ago, this part of Dubai was desert. 
There's the Burj Al Arab. It's become the symbol of Dubai. I mean, how much of this is ego? And are you all quite, you know, competitive people? Is it like, you've built the biggest tower, I'm going to go and build a bigger one? It's not about the ego, it's about to show the capability. We want to show our royal family that we can do it. And what they're looking for is to build something unique, something extraordinary. And with this kind of development, we attract foreigners. I mean, how much money is there down there now, would you guess? The last number announced recently was around $300 billion. $300 billion US dollars, just swimming around below us. I was told your very first major project here, you made 150 million US dollars on that deal. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And you cleaned up. I mean, you made 150 million bucks. And the good thing, once I came with the... You're allowed to smile when I say that figure, by the way. <laughs> I know to you it's not much money. To me, I mean, this is, like, unbelievable. What's it like being a billionaire? You look like you have a lot of fun. You're always smiling. Yeah, you really enjoy it. For us, we don't really enjoy with money and cash. We really enjoy with family. It's about more cultural friendship between the family relationship and the friend relationship. Now, that's a family I'd like to get into. I wonder if he has any single female relatives. So, we've seen the city from the air. Now it was time to see it at ground level, in the world's only Versace Lamborghini Murcielago. Dr. Suleiman paid $600,000 more than the standard car for this designer model to ensure he cuts a dash on Dubai's highways. The big thing in Dubai is about number plates, isn't it? Yeah, number plates are very important. Your one is 737. Is that a valuable one? Yes. But the two digits is more important. I have the 93. 93? I bought because that's the year of graduation of my wife. And how much was that? Today it's worth $2 million. $2 million? Yes. For 93? Yes. Somebody would pay you $2 million for that? Amazing. Thank goodness his wife didn't graduate in 83. Even he might have struggled to pay for that one. With such mind-boggling spending power on tap, it'll come as no surprise that all pockets are catered for. Shopping here at one of Dubai's super malls is a bit like being back at home, to be honest. Harvey Nicks behind me, a Lacoste over there, Starbucks, Zara. The only difference here is you've always got to look out for that unexpected visit by the billionaire Arab Sheikh. So, how about a mobile phone? What do they cost? Will be 102. 110 thousand. pounds? Yes, 1,000 pounds. 110,000 pounds, I see. <laughs> and this one? This is 100,000 pounds. Oh, OK, so that's a bit more of a bargain. Yes. So do you actually sell these phones? A few weeks ago, the one Sheikh chose four telephones. So Arab Sheikh came past your shop and bought four of these? Yes. For half a million pounds? Yes. <laughs> Blimey, what on earth do you do when you want an upgrade? It's all so easy to get sucked into the affluent lifestyle in Dubai. The place just drips success. Most expats here enjoy a quality of life they could only have dreamt about back in Britain. Vast villas, sprawling staircases, giant swimming pools and personal maids. They spend their days enjoying the leisure at five-star hotels like this and their nights at parties covered by the society pages of Hello magazine. Small wonder, then, that so many start to feel, well, a little bit grand. After all, back in Britain, they were minnows. Here in Dubai, everyone's a whale. Tonight's the Hot 100 party, an annual event where the local version of Hello! magazine draws up a chart of all the movers and shakers in town. In the main, it's the likes of spa managers and boutique owners that make it, but it's taken very seriously. If you're in, you're in. And if you're out, you may as well be in Goodbye magazine. You've made it. You haven't. <laughs> well, actually, I may have. I've just been speaking to the editor. <laughs> There's this whole sort of strata zone that you get into when you get into the Hot 100. I mean, it's quite cool to be considered, like, hot. And apparently none hotter than yours truly. Well, the hottest thing that I found at the Ahlan Hot 100 party is Mr Piers Morgan. Welcome. Hello. Expat life here revolves around the 50 or so five-star hotels. That's because once inside, you never need know you're in a country where alcohol is frowned on, it's illegal to kiss in public or be gay or share a flat with your girlfriend. 
Dubai knows it needs Westerners to succeed and so deliberately turns a blind eye to goings-on, providing they go on on the private property of the hotels, a kind of expat bubble where life is good and intoxicating. The Barasti Bar is a regular expat haunt. It's not far from where a couple of Brits were recently arrested for having sex on the beach, although I believe that might be illegal back home as well. Enjoying herself in a slightly more legal way is 46-year-old mother of two from Birmingham, Karen Brady. Dressed to kill tonight, Karen. Always, always. Is this your nightly this is gener is Generally, it? generally, yes, generally. Less is more. Less is more. Less is definitely more. <laughs> and what's it like, I mean, the, the nightlife here? Every single night you can party without fail. Come out here, oh. party, party. It's like non-stop, non-stop. And you get drunk? Uh, frequently. <laughs> And are you making loads of money here? Absolutely loads. Millions. No, so you here, came loads for, the, for the money and the parties? Absolutely, yeah. In what Absolutely. order? Well, first money, then the party. And what's the, what's the man scene like here? I'm not looking for the man. I'm just here enjoying myself. I've been married all my life and I'm not doing that anymore. But you go on dates here and stuff? Sometimes, or? yeah, I do, yeah. I like to have dinner with intellectual men, but I generally don't fancy them. Right. Well, we should go for dinner then. <laughs> In the last year, 230 Brits have ended up in Dubai's prisons for a range of offences from the normal, like drink driving, to the abnormal, like bouncing a cheque. If you are going to come out here, make sure you learn the law. For example, sex outside of marriage can get you a year in jail. Possession of over-the-counter drugs that contain codeine, four years. Even Harry Potter books were recently banned from schools because witchcraft is strictly illegal in Dubai. It's a difficult society to get your head around. On the one hand, a traditional autocratic leader uses strict Sharia-based law to rule with a rod of iron. On the other hand, in the five-star hotels, you can forget you're even in the Middle East. But the two cultures exist side by side in parallel universes, and except for at the shopping malls, rarely mix. Consequently, the expats live in fear of making a silly mistake or inadvertently breaking a law that could, with a swipe of the pen, see them deported. I drove into the desert with blogger and ex-journalist Alexander McNabb. He's been living out here for almost 20 years and has first-hand experience of what happens when the two cultures clash. <laughs> it is something on the moon, isn't it? Amazing. When I first moved here, that was in the early 90s, I came out here running a magazine which was shut down because I criticised the wrong guy's computer. Uh, it was a computer review mag and the computer didn't work. And so we said the computer doesn't work. Um, which, in retrospect, was probably naive of me. Or to but, tell the truth. To tell the truth. Um, but it offended a man who happened to be related to a man who happened to be in a position to do something about it. So my office was sealed by the Ministry of Information. Now, the great thing about Dubai today is that actually probably can't happen. Is it relaxing, the censorship? Is it getting easier? Yes, it is. If you can stand up a good story where a government department has behaved appallingly, I think you've got a chance of running that story. When I first came out here, you wouldn't have done. So you're now seeing allegations being made against some quite big figures in government uh, and corruption um, investigations going on that were unthinkable here. It's a process of change. If you're in the media out here as you are, do you live in permanent fear that a wrong word could see you on the next plane back to Britain deported? Are you wary about what you're telling me, for example? No, I don't think I have that fear. Um, I might be horribly wrong, but I don't think I have that fear. I don't live in fear. I don't live in fear of saying what I think. Oh, I worry, but I've just seen two quad bites with a couple of government officials it's nipping you. over that dune. It's you they're after. They've been listening, haven't they? <laughs> Part of the problem lies in the fact that the Sheikh can change laws virtually overnight. While we were filming, in an attempt to stop overcrowding amongst unskilled workers, it was decreed illegal to share property with anyone except close family. If you're thinking of coming out here, make sure you do your homework. Super. I'm off to meet an old friend, Patty Parfit. She moved out here with her son, Harry, after separating from her wayward husband, Rick, guitarist of status quo. 
She'd been out here on holiday and thought Dubai would be the ideal place to change the status quo and mend a broken heart. A year on, however, and the Dubai dream is turning sour. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm good, thank you, darling. How lovely to see you. And you, how are you? The last time I saw you was on a status quo tour bus. <laughs> we don't talk about that. <laughs> Welcome to my home. So this is your lovely piece of Dubai paradise. This is uh, Very nice. this is our little uh, our little uh, hacienda. So this is the lounge. Yeah. This four-bedroomed house is typical of the expat family lifestyle out here. Inside landscape gated communities are miles from anywhere. So this is the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Thankfully for the neighbours, it's detached. So Paddy, you're in a very nice place here, but it's half an hour inland. What would you pay here for your rent? What are you? Oh, you're going to die. Thirty-two thousand pounds for the year, and you have to pay wow. up front in Dubai. So, so you had to write a cheque for thirty-two thousand pounds. Yeah. Yeah. For a year's rent in advance. Yeah. See, that strikes me as pretty expensive. It is. I mean, it's ridiculous so your, rent. your rental is up for renewal. What are you going to do? I'm taking it for six months, and then I'll just see how I go there. And what are but, they going to charge you for that? Uh, £27,000. What? In one year? They've yeah. nearly doubled it? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, be warned, if your employer's not subsidising your rent, you'll be in for a nasty shock. It's terribly expensive in Dubai. It if you really get this idea is. of it, it's this wonderful tax-free haven. Yeah. Everything's dirt cheap. So it's not really like that. No. And, you know, I don't want to spoil anybody's holiday or dream to move to Dubai, but you've really got to look at it because it's not all what it's cracked up to be. People who are watching this are going to be thinking, I quite fancy coming to Dubai. Yeah. And yet you seem to have fallen slightly out of love with the dream. Yes, I have, haven't I? Oh, God, where do I go now? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do miss my friends. I do miss my family. And it is difficult uh, to meet people over here because everybody's basically, it's family. And when I go out, I am a threat. I bet you are. How old are you? 57. I mean, that is amazing. Yeah. Recently divorced. Long, to a rock star. Long bombshell. Used to be with a rock star. You are public enemy number one to these women. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's rock and roll. <laughs> so what does the future hold for Dubai? I'll be looking at the changing face of society here as it opens its doors wider to Western values. Could their secret defence against the credit crunch come down to a few familiar faces? Try some of these. Oh, disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and just how much are they prepared to spend to make sure Dubai does become the greatest city in the world. Pilot will be getting millions. Multi-millions. Multi-millions. In the UK, we've taken thousands of years to develop our laws and customs, whereas Dubai has had just a couple of decades to try and find common ground so the 205 nationalities can happily coexist. Consider this, just 1.3 million people live here. Of those, 200,000 are Western expats. 900,000 are Asians, mainly workers. And that leaves just 200,000 local Emiratis. To put that in perspective, imagine living in Britain, where five out of six people were foreigners. And when you think of it like that, you kind of begin to work out that Dubai is actually quite a tolerant place. <laughs> It's a sign of Dubai's willingness to welcome foreigners into its midst to keep moving forward. And someone taking full advantage of that acceptance is Derek Khan. Oh, it's very good. <laughs> Derek, a former fashion stylist to pop stars like Salt and Pepper and Snoop Dogg, is today better known as an ex jewel thief. What happened? I am very stupidly, I pawned jewels. And um, of course, pawning, you don't pawn what is not yours. And I dug myself into a nightmarish hole. I would have to go take one piece of jewel, go to another company, and lied basically mm -hmm. to get another piece, and which I pawned, and it became a circle, a, a and nightmare you got circle. And I you got a two-year prison in. sentence. Yes, I did. He served two years in a New York jail for his crimes, was kicked out of the U.S. and settled here in Dubai, reinventing himself as, get this, a jewelry designer. 
there you are, a convicted thief, felon, for, mm -hmm. for want of a better phrase. You're kicked out of America, and then Dubai, where you would imagine they're quite strict about that kind of thing, they welcome you in here. I was accepted into Dubai because I think I was very straightforward with what I had done. Mm. I was very straightforward in who I am, and, and they kind of saw what I can You're do. You're also fairly unique, though. I mean, there aren't many Derricks in Dubai that I've met. <laughs> Not with this look, the whole thing, you know? Well, you'd be surprised. Dubai is just, you know, I, I, I get There it. are more of you out there? I, oh, I kind of, I hope not, but... <laughs> Put it in, give me a little, exactly, a little swing. What I hear everywhere is that if you do this, you're out. If you do that, you'll be deported. So, what I haven't found is any real evidence they actually do this. I mean, do people get chucked out of Dubai? Well, of course they do, You of know course. people who've been deported? Well, no, I don't. That's the <laughs> point. I mean, I don't know anyone who's been deported. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is... There seems is... to be a collective fear of being deported well, without see, any evidence well, anyone ever is. Well, listen, the collective fear works because guess what? I can open my car, and I've, especially from New York City, I could never dare leave my computer in the car. I do it all the time. I leave my doors unlocked at home. You think that the, the rules are a small price to pay, really? For... Oh, much, a very small price to pay. You know, it gives you that sense of security. And um, I couldn't be happier here. Right, beautiful, beautiful, right. lovely. If Dubai is going to succeed, now more than ever, it needs people. It has to be seen as the in place, somewhere you can't afford not to be. So when Dubai can't build it, Dubai buys it, spending millions on celebrity names and, crucially, brands. Gary Rose is the latest big name lured into town. He'll be in good company. Gordon Ramsay and Marco Pierre White are already here and raking it in. Gary, how are you? Hi, very good, thank you. Nice to very, see you. Very good. You too. You came just at the right time. Try some of these. That is a little salmon fish cake with a lemon hollandaise. God, that's disgusting. <laughs> I don't even laugh. I mean, it's actually delicious, but <laughs> just to see what your face is like. It's delicious. Tell me, Gun, you've flown all the way to Dubai. Yeah. And you've flown all the food out here as well. Oh, yes. Why don't you just stay in England? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, it's 36 yeah. degrees outside and it's snowing in the UK. Where would yeah. you choose? You know, it's... I just thought, no, you know, I want to spread the word about British cooking. But be honest, Gary, would you be out here if there wasn't a whacking great big Arabic check in it? <laughs> I mean, I know a lot yeah. of chefs, right? I must you all like your money. Hang on, where's that contract of mine? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's it's not a question of that, is it? It's, I mean, oh, that's always the... is, Isn't it, though? Because, I mean, I know a lot of brand names like you. You're such high commodities out here. That they will pay whatever it takes to get you. Well, I think, you know, if, if I start cooking for money rather than cooking for what I really believe in, I'd rather give it up. So there you have it, the definitive answer, with hollandaise sauce. Mark, how are you? Hello, Piers, how are you? Good to see you again, and up on the 44th floor, another bought-in brand name. Mark Fuller will be opening a version of London's Embassy Club here next year. No offence to you, Mark, but you and Gary Rhodes are not exactly, you know, the Beckhams. <laughs> and yet you're getting a lot of money thrown at you to come here. What's in it for them to get you? Someone was saying to me today that it's all very well opening a hotel, but you've got to entice people into it. It's like all over the world. The difference is, is they're buying a name brand because it's a new country. I mean, is it rude of me to push you on just how many millions they paid you to come here? Uh, no, uh, I, won't, I won't say that. It wasn't, it wasn't millions, but it was quite an acceptable figure. What about Tiger Woods and people like that? Oh, you see their God, names. Tiger Woods... Um, you know, Christina Aguilera's, mm. those sort of people, Kylie's, will be getting millions. Multi-millions. Multi-millions. Is that because the people of Dubai, the rulers here, realise that celebrities of that power are a PR magnet for here? I think, without a doubt, in the end, this was a piece of desert. This was a piece of sand. They've built a city out of nothing. How do you attract everybody? They, they want to be number one. They don't want to be number two, number three, number four. They want to be Miami. They want to beat Miami. They want to be New York. They want to beat New York, you know. So the only answer is bring it in. Kylie comes, Beyonce comes. I mean, even Iron Maiden have played here. It is almost surreal here. It's the land of make-believe. It certainly is. More like the land of unbelievable. Because as the world is rocked to the core by the credit crunch, Dubai rocked to the sound of Kylie at the world's most expensive party. The Atlantis Hotel was launched with a massive £7 million extravaganza. Looks like an awful lot of that went up in smoke. Let's face it, for the ordinary Brits living here, as long as you toe the line, life's pretty good. For the investor, though, even ultra-affluent Dubai is fragile. 
It doesn't manufacture anything of value. Oil now accounts for just 6% of its income. And even though uber-wealthy neighbour Abu Dhabi pumped £9 billion into its economy back in October, Dubai remains exposed. Three big government-backed construction companies are already laying off hundreds of employees. Dubai relies on foreign investors to make it work. And without them, Dubai's dream of becoming the greatest city on Earth may have to wait. I came to Dubai to find out if it really is all it's cracked up to be. And the answer, if you like sun and fun, glitz and glamour, is a resounding yes. As for the credit crunch, everyone I've met here says the same thing. Dubai won't just survive, it will thrive. And that's because it's bursting with ambition and drive, all led by one man's extraordinary vision and an utter determination to turn this place into the biggest and most successful city in the world. As for my part, I think I'll borrow the favourite phrase of the British builder. It'll be all right when it's finished. <laughs>